So years ago, I went to a seminar at the a local church here, and there was a prophet sitting up on the platform. His name was Bob Jones, and he used one phrase. He sat there with his shorts on and his dirty T-shirt. I thought the guy was kind of weird. Prophets generally can be. And he said this one phrase. He looked out and as if he was looking at me personally. He said, Buffalo, the Jebusites are occupying your land. I didn't know who the Jebusites were. I went home and asked Doral because she's really smart. She likes to ferret out words and find out what they mean, so she did. And she found out that their name means to trample underfoot. And so I put the two together and said, so that means that the Jebusites are trampling buffalo underfoot. I also believe that there's a principle that we should follow when studying the scriptures, the principle of first mention. And the first time trample is mentioned is in the Old Testament, Genesis 2, where God gives Adam the mandate to rule over all the earth. That word rule in the Hebrew is radah, which means to trample. In other words, wherever you go, Adam, occupy the land. Trample the land and occupy it. And expand my kingdom purpose in all the world as you walk through the land. Also notice that it wasn't until Joshua that that ability to trample was restored because Adam lost it in the garden when he fell to sin. And he and his wife were separated, and separated them from their Lord. Also lost their power and their ability to trample the land. But in Joshua, that's restored as Joshua gets everyone ready to move into the promised land. It says they put their foot, their foot. What do you trample with? You trample with your foot, correct? Put their foot in the water, and it backed up all the way to a town called Adam. And when I read that, I saw a picture of the restoration of the authority of man to trample and to occupy the land. Sure enough, Joshua walked over through into the promised land, and there he told the people to walk around the walls of Jericho. Don't say a word, just trample the land. Six times they went around, the seventh time they went around, they put a trumpet to their mouth, and with one loud shout, the walls of Jericho fell in on the people and they occupied the land. How did they occupy the land? By trampling the land. I also noticed in 2 Samuel 5, when David became king, he invited everyone to come to the Mount of Hebron to there establish a covenant with them. I was in Israel doing this teaching. I asked one of the rabbis there, what was that covenant? He said, I don't know, because it doesn't tell us. And I said, I believe it was a salt covenant, because a salt covenant is a covenant of unity, It is a covenant that establishes friendship, and Hebron is called the Mountain of Friends. What better place to establish the Salt Covenant than than the Mountain of Friends? So David gathered all the people of Israel, all the leaders of Israel together, and there he established the covenant of salt on that mountain. And then it says this, that David and his men went into Jerusalem to remove the Jebusites from Jerusalem, the place of worship. You see, the Jebusites occupied the land. They were trampling the land, much like they were trampling Buffalo, New York. They were trampling the land. David, with his men, went in and removed the Jebusites from the land, and there established Jerusalem as a center of worship. I believe that God wants our places, our churches, our families, our city, our nation to be a center of worship. But it can't happen when the Jebusites trample the land. Make sense? And until the Jebusites are removed, our center of worship is not established. When we become salt, we have the power, we have the authority to go into the land and remove the Jebusites, occupy the land, and establish centers of worship. One of the reasons why churches struggle so much is because of division and separation, because they've lost their saltiness. They become good for nothing. Because they've lost their saltiness, instead of being a place of worship, it becomes a place of discord and disharmony. 
Amen? Hearing what I'm saying, this isn't even in my notes. This is coming right out of my heart. Because I see it. I see it in homes. Maybe your home. Maybe your family. Maybe you feel like it's being trampled underfoot by a powerful spirit. I'm telling you, salt not only heals, but salt restores authority. In fact, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends his disciples out. They come back all excited because demons were fleeing from them. They were healing the sick and raising the dead. Can you imagine having that happening in western New York in our churches? And Jesus looks at him and he makes a profound statement. He said, I have given you authority to trample. There's that word. All the way from the mandate in Genesis, all the way up through history, to Jesus, the final Adam. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, all the power of the enemy that occupies your homes, your families, your churches, your cities, your towns. And then he issues a warning, a very strong warning in Matthew 5. He said, if salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Why are we trampled? Why do we lose authority? Because we lose our saltiness. The salt covenant is a covenant of loyalty. It's a covenant of unity. It's a covenant of friendship. In fact, that's the key word to the covenant is friend. You're my friend. How many of you have good friends? You know what makes a friend a friend? Somebody who knows your heart. Somebody who knows your hopes and somebody who knows your dreams. Somebody who comes alongside of you and says, I want to walk with you to help you make that possible. That's a friend. That's a true friend. That's what this covenant is all about. Back in 1968, before some of you were even born, there was a group called the Three Dog Knights. I don't know why they call them the Three Dog Knights. I tried to find out. They wrote a song called One. Remember that song? One is the loneliest number you'll ever do. Then they say this, two can be bad as one. If they don't get along, it's true, isn't it? I don't know if they thought about that when they wrote those words. It's the loneliest number since the number one. No, it's the saddest experience you'll ever know. Yes, the saddest experience you'll ever know. Because one is the loneliest number you'll ever do. One is the loneliest number. Whoa, ho, worse than two. <laughs> now I spend my time making rhymes because I'm all alone. One is the loneliest number you can ever do. Let me define for you in your notes up your notes. I'm going to define for you the word alone. It can be defined by one word, miserable. Everybody write the word miserable in there. You want to be miserable? Spend your life alone. Solomon in chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes 8 through 12 addresses the issue of being alone. And listen to what he says in verse 8. There was a man all alone, probably talking about himself, by the way, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother, and there was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. See that? Toiling for yourself deprives you of enjoyment. You enjoy things when you do it with others, isn't that right? I have to keep myself from telling some stories because I want to get through this. But I got a great story that I got to tell you. I was in the Philippines in the Peace Corps, and Dorald was back here. We weren't married yet. And I remember one night in a hut, in a resettlement village, something dropped off the ceiling onto my chest, crawled across my chest onto the ground, and said, I'm alone. I don't want to do this anymore. I wanted to go home and be with Dorald. So I sent her a letter and asked her to marry me. She never responded, so I don't know if she said yes or not. 
But I went home and I married her because I didn't want to be alone. I know how important it is to have somebody to share your life with. Whether you're married or you're not married, a friend is somebody you can do that with. A companion. Somebody who knows your dreams and your hopes and walks alongside of you and says, hey, I want to make it possible. When a critter drops down onto your chest, I want to be there to brush it off and help you stop screaming in terror. It goes on in verse 9. Ecclesiastes is a two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. One of the benefits, one of the benefits to having two instead of one is mutual support. You get mutual support. In other words, if you fall down, there's somebody there to pick you up and to support you when you stumble. Verse 11, he says, also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. How can one keep warm alone? The second benefit to not being alone is mutual encouragement. You know, the warmth of a friend coming alongside of you, a warm body pulling up alongside of you, putting their arm around your shoulder and saying, listen, I know how you feel. I've walked this road together. Let's not walk it alone, but let's walk it together. I'll be with you. What does that do? That encourages you, that imparts to you courage when someone else is there alongside of you. Verse 12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend himself. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And also the benefit of two is that you have mutual strength. If I can pick up a hundred pounds... Angel, you can pick up 100 pounds. Together, we can pick up 300 pounds. It's a fact. It's a fact. You have more strength together. Remember these. Two together have mutual support, mutual encouragement, mutual strength. Where does the salt covenant come from? It comes right out of the scriptures. I've had people ask me that. It comes right out of the Old Testament. Three times it's mentioned. Leviticus 2.13, season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. I wish I had time to teach about the saltiness of our offerings. Numbers 18 to 19, whatever is set aside from the holy offering, the Israelites presented to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and your daughters as you share It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord for both you and your offsprings. This is my favorite. 2 Chronicles 13.5 Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given kingship, authority of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? Covenant of salt. Why is it a covenant of salt? Why isn't it a covenant of sugar? How many of you are Grandkids like sugar better than they like salt. I can get them to do anything with sugar, a cookie, anything. Salt, not so much, but sugar, that's a winner. So why is it salt? This is important. God knows what he's talking about because he made all the elements and he brought all the elements in combination. So he knows what he's talking about. In your notes... Salt represents our unbreakable bond with one another. Do you know salt is one of the strongest chemical bonds known to man? Salt is made up of two primary elements, sodium and chloride. Separated, they are very deadly. Very deadly. But when they come together, they do something absolutely amazing, unique to those two compounds. Sodium and chloride, when they come together, they share their electrons. They make an electronic connection that makes them almost inseparable. Have you ever been swimming in a pool and you tasted salt in the water? It's because somebody took salt and put it in a filter. And the filter had the ability to separate the sodium from the chloride. And you know how it does that? It does it through electricity. The sodium and chloride pass over an electric plate and it separates, it breaks that bond. And then it puts chlorine into the water along with sodium. It's low amounts, otherwise you would die in that pool. But it's able to do it. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6 
speaks about this unbreakable bond. Listen to this scripture because it's critical. It speaks about this unbreakable bond that we have with one another. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Look at me just for a second. I've said over the years, the church is an absolute design for failure. There is no way the church should work. Think about it. You come from all different backgrounds, all different places, you have all different desires, you have different experiences in church, and you come in here with the expectation that this church is going to be similar to your church. You come in, you see people raise their hands, you leave because you don't go to a church that raises their hands. Or you hear the pastor say amen, or you hear people call each other brothers and sisters, and like me, long ago, you think they're weird for calling each other brothers and sisters. All kinds of backgrounds come in here. All kinds of backgrounds come in here. God begins to move. You have an enemy who comes in to bring offenses and all kinds of things against one another. You have an enemy called Satan who desires nothing more than to split our oneness and to separate us, to cause all kinds of problems amongst our, the church. You have a pastor who doesn't know what he's doing 90% of the time. And some pastors don't even like people. One pastor said the church will be fine if it wasn't for people. But here's the truth. All of that comes together. You have the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. It's a design for failure except for one thing. It's the Holy Spirit who brings unity. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that overrides all of that and brings unity. And so Paul is saying, be diligent. Listen to me, church. It takes diligent to preserve unity. That's why we do this every year. Because I know how fragile unity really is. In your homes, unity is fragile. If you don't think so, wait till you have a 16-year-old daughter. Unity is fragile. And so it takes diligence to preserve that unity. He goes on and he says, there is only one body. Everybody say, one body. One spirit. Say, one spirit. Just as you were also called to one hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all through all and in all, this bond of the Holy Spirit, this bond of peace that Ephesians 4 talks about, describes, described there, can be easily broken through pride, the power of the tongue, offenses that come between us, and something that's becoming more and more prevalent today, the teachings of false doctrines that can divide the church, and break the bond of the Spirit. That's why Scripture says in Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, this is a strong Scripture. Look at this Scripture. There are six things the Lord hates. You see that? Do you see that? Maybe we should hate it too. Maybe. The Lord hates. No, seven things he detests haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. Apply that to your workplace. Wherever you go, apply that to a football team that's trying to win an important game. I didn't say anything about Buffalo losing, seriously. I think they really like each other. I really, I really think they do. It's going, to, it's going to make them winners eventually. They get all the people in the right place. Getting along makes us winners, doesn't it? Unity makes us winners, doesn't it? When we all play on the same team for the same purpose, we guard our tongues, we, we get rid of our pride, we don't plot evil against one another. Or so discord. Why salt? Because it represents our unbreakable bond and the Holy Spirit between us. But number two, salt represents life. It's interesting. 
You know where we get our word salary from? Salt. That's where it comes from. You ever heard the phrase, he's not worth his salt? It's making reference back in the Old Testament times when Roman soldiers were paid with salt because salt was so valuable. It was so hard to get. You know, we didn't have the modern means of extracting salt the way we do. You'd have to take seawater and let the water evaporate till you had salt. And so salt was precious. Wars were fought over salt. In fact, I was in India one time doing the salt, Kevin. It read on the front pages, there was a celebration of Mahatma Gandhi 50 years ago or whatever it was when he launched the salt revolution in India to set India free from oppression from England because England would not allow them to harvest salt from the sea. And because they couldn't harvest salt, they controlled the people. The only way you could preserve food was with salt. And salt is life. If you don't have salt, you're going to die. And they knew that, so they controlled the salt, they controlled the people. And so we get our word salary from the word salt. In fact, if you make a salary in here, you know how you get that salary? You give your life. Isn't that right? And so you want a job that means something to you. Isn't that right? Because it's your life you're giving when you receive your salary. So salt represents life because salt is all through your body. Remember I said that salt is made up of sodium and chloride and combined they share their electrons? Remember that? Well, the salt in your body makes electrical impulses possible, the nerve endings possible to communicate with one another, and all the organs of your body possible. If you take salt out of your body, your body will stop communicating with itself. Isn't that right, Julie? You'll go into shock. You'll be good for nothing. You'll become eventually dead. Salt is essential for communication within your body, within the organisms, your nerve endings. It's important for you to be able to operate. If you go into the hospital because you're sick or because you have an accident, what's the first thing they do? They give you a shot of beer, right? No, they hook you up to an IV and give you a saline solution. Salt into your body. They fill your body with salt and water. Why? Because salt promotes healing. It encourages electrical connections within the various organs of your body. When salt is added to your body, your body works better. It works to an optimal degree, and it promotes healing. When a car engine bangs and makes funny noises, what do you do? You take it to Chad. No. You look and see if the oil light is on. If it needs oil, you put oil in it, ladies. I remember a time when the engine was banging and my lady didn't put oil in it. It will destroy the car. Well, as oil is to a car, so salt is to the body. I just noticed recently that they've opened salt caves in western New York. It's the place to go to get healing to go and sit in these salt caves, and it does all kinds of things to heal your body. When I was going through chemo with cancer, first thing I did was I bought a infrared sauna. I go in there every day for 26 minutes at 126 degrees, sweat profusely, getting all the toxins out of my body. Then after that I'd go and I'd fill a bathtub full of hot water with Epsom salts and sea salt. And I'd sit in there and I'd soak getting all the poisons and all the sickness out of my body. And I'm here today to tell you that salt heals. Prayer heals, salt helps. It gets us through those hard things. You want to know more about it? Send me a text. I'll give you the formula. It's amazing how salt can heal your body. It heals your soul, heals your spirit. Salt is our testimony to the world. When a church is salty, it functions as it's optimal, and it's our testimony to the world. In fact, Scripture says that it creates an abundant life, unity. Listen to Psalm 133. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live in unity. It's wonderful and pleasant. 
when your kids get along, the Father in heaven says. Amen? He says, unity is precious. How many of you agree with that? It is. It's precious. As the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard under the border of his collars, unity is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on Mount Zion. And there the Lord commands his blessing in life forevermore. So in the place of unity, the Father looks down. It's good and pleasant. There's an anointing in the place. Worship is strong and powerful in that place. Like Mount Hermon, it's a dew, it's a refreshing place. And in that place, God commands a blessing. I told the story in the past about my kids playing. I'd watch them play, and, and they got along good. They'd come up and say, Dad, can we have ice cream? I'd say, sure. How much you want? If they didn't get along good, I'd say, are you kidding me? The last thing I want to do is sit down and have ice cream with you. But if they got along well, I commanded a blessing over their lives. God the Father is the same way. Where there's unity, there is a blessing. Life forevermore. It's where people come into that place and say, Jesus is real. Because they taste the saltiness of our unity. The light goes on and they see the glory of God. There's a thought. Without the salt, the light goes off. We'll show you that in just a minute. Why salt? Because salt represents the unbreakable bond that we have in the Holy Spirit. Salt represents life. There's salt all through your body. And number three, salt represents who we are. Who we are. Jesus said that we're to be two things in this world. You know what they are? Salt and light. That's what he said. Salt and light. It's not hard to know who Jesus wants us to be. He wants us to be salt so that we can be light. I.e., if you're not salt, then you can't be light. There's an order to that. Taste and see the Lord is good. Amen? First you taste, then the light bulb goes on. Then you see. In fact, he says in Matthew 5, 13 to 16, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You're the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do pe people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put, put it and let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. Praise your Father in heaven. The key phrase in there, the thing that arrests my heart, and should yours as well, is thrown out and trampled by men. That's, that's a powerful statement by Jesus. That's a statement of judgment. Do you know that? To be trampled underfoot by somebody is a place of judgment. To have somebody stick their foot around your neck is a place of judgment. And Jesus is saying, if you lose your saltiness, you'll be judged. Judged. You'll be good for nothing. You'll be good for nothing. I said that came, came from the mandate given to Adam back in Genesis. Radah was to trample over all the earth. But Adam lost his saltiness. Sin entered the garden. It split his relationship with God and with his wife. They left the garden defeated. Instead of trampling over the earth, they were trampled on all the way up until the time of Jesus who came and restored that and said, I give you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, all the power of the enemy. But, even though I've given you that authority, listen to what I'm saying, Jesus would say to you. Listen to what I'm saying. If you lose your saltiness, if there's a break in your bond together because of pride and dissension or whatever it is, you may think it feels good to you right now, but I'm telling you, it's going to bring judgment because you'll be good for nothing. You will not fulfill the purposes that I have for you. Not only for your life, but also the bigger picture for my kingdom. You see the picture? So he's saying, keep your saltiness. When Jesus gave this warning, he was talking to people who knew what he was talking about. Back in those days, they would line these cook stoves with salt. 
Even fire pits would be lined with salt. And what the salt did was it would preserve the heat. It would keep the heat within it. Until finally the fire that was inside the pot or the pit would destroy the salt, and then the salt would be good for nothing. So they would take the salt out and they would throw it on paths and people would trample on it. That's what Jesus was talking about. You know what I think he was talking about? I think he's referring back to Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul says, keep the unity of the Spirit. Because you see, when we have unity, when we have this bond between us, when we're salt, the fire of God's love burns within our hearts. And that fire is not easily extinguished. That fire spreads, but when we lose our saltiness, the fire goes out and the light goes out. And you can scream and shout and jump, run around the church until your hair falls out, but if you lose your saltiness, then the Holy Spirit picks up and moves on and the fire is gone. And all you're doing is making a gonging, clanging sound wherever there isn't love. Write that down. I've been doing this for 30 years, and I've been in a lot of meetings, and I've seen it. And I've felt it, and I've experienced that loss when there's no salt. So if we're salt and light, the fire of God's love burns deep within us. Jeff, you want to come? There should be a mic. Hello? Oh, good. Uh, good morning. So uh, my name is Jeff, and this is my son, David, and we're going to do a little demonstration for you um, about salt and light. Um, but before we do, I just wanted to say that oftentimes when we pray at home with the kids, we talk about um, being the salt and light. We pray that they are the salt and the light when they go about in their school and with their friends. And really, um, you know, that's it's, it's a good phrase, but what does that mean? It means really to be salt, to be like Christ with their friends and with the people that are around them, and then be that light um, to those people that they interact with every day. Um, really, it's, it's hard to do that. It's impossible to do that if you don't have the salt. You can't be that light without the salt. So we're going to kind of demonstrate that. Uh, one other thing that I thought of when I was um, sitting there was just coming out of Christmas, and everybody, you ever notice how there's that first house that puts the Christmas lights up, and then you're like, oh, I got to put my light up, and then the other neighbor's like, oh, I got my light up. So to me, I think what it is, is, is when you are the salt and the light, that light shines, and that light is contagious, and other people have that light too, and it just glows. In this world where there's so much darkness, particularly for our kids, it's so important that they have the salt, and they have the teaching, and that they are the light for those that are around them that are lost and they can see that light. So we're going to do this demonstration, and we're going to do, pray that it works, <laughs> and pray that nobody gets electrocuted. Um, okay, so what we're going to do, if you want to plug that in. It's got rubber sneakers on. I did test this out. You got sneakers on? We do have sneakers, yes. Okay. You have to say that down there. All right, so what we have here really is uh, we've got a container, an empty container, uh, hooked up to a light bulb, and now it's, it's live. So we're going to pour in, or David's going to pour in distilled water. Distilled water is water with all minerals. Everything is removed from it. Uh, and it's non-conductive. It has no salt. It's got no way. It doesn't represent anything. Okay? So we've got a live wire going through water, which should cause some sort of electric reaction. It does not. Um, and so what we're going to do is just grab the salt, so the salt really is, um, you know, representing Christ. So we pour the salt in, slowly. Keep going. And hopefully it works. Is it plugged in? Yeah. To the wall? It may not be. Okay, It's hold not on. plugged into the wall. All right, hold on. You want to go plug that into the wall? Okay, we did try it. Okay, this is going to go on instantly now. Yep. 
There we go. <laughs> you want to pour some more in? Yep. So the more salt, the more light you have. Good. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Great. Can I unplug that? So there's the live wires. I remember one year we did this, and I said, stick your hand in there. And they stuck their hand in there, and nothing happened. But yeah, if this was plugged in, the more salt they put in there, the, the brighter the light gets. It's really quite a profound visual there. So that represents who we are right there. If there's no salt, then there's no light. You get the picture, right? So it represents who we are. So, why salt? Let me do a quick review. Salt represents our unbreakable bond and the Holy Spirit between us. Salt represents our life together. Salt represents who we are together. And number four, salt represents the peace that we have with one another. In James 4, 1 through 4, James talks about that peace. He talks about what separates us. He says these words, he says, What's causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. Isn't that something? It's quite a description of what divides and separates us, what destroys the peace between us. You know, when that happens, when these kinds of things enter into your life and into the church and into your families and begin to divide and separate you, God has a surefire method of getting those things out of you. Aren't you glad that God, who begins a work in you, will see it to completion? Aren't you glad? You know how he does it? Fire. That's right. He sends trials along. Trials and tribulation. They do their magic. They break down all of those things like pride. Oh yeah, pride. I know about pride. And having cancer and having to go being inspected over and over again and poked and prodded by women. I know about pride. I know about how how trials and fire can take you down to the bottom so that everything begins to look a little bit different. And life begins to line up in the right perspective. In fact, Mark 9, 49 to 50, one of my favorite scriptures is, everyone will be salted with fire. It's baffled theologians for years. I've got the answer. What does that mean? Everyone will be salted with fire. It goes on to say salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? If salt loses its saltiness, it's really difficult to make it salty again. Isn't that right? If there's an offense between you and somebody else, if there's an issue, if there's a pride thing between you, isn't it difficult to reconnect, to make salt salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. See, the key to reestablishing the saltiness is right there in verse 49. Everyone will be salted with fire for years and years. I burned fire. I burned wood and fire. I had two pieces of wood up here. I did have. Anyway, I had a piece of pine and a piece of cherry I was going to show you. They seem to have disappeared like that wasn't plugged in. Anyway, they're gone, but you know that in order to have a fire, you need both kinds of wood, don't you? Some of you don't, may not know that. But you need the pine, you need the soft wood that's kindling to get the fire going. Isn't that right? And then you need the hardwoods, the maples and the oak and things like that. I left it in the back, didn't I? And then you need the hardwood to keep it burning and to keep it warm for yourself. So both of these are important. It's the same thing with us. 
Some of you are like kindling. I'm looking around, I'm seeing some kindling out there. You're a fire happening no matter where you go. <laughs> Debbie Morant. I mean, you're just like, poof. And you burn, and we're, you're important to us. We need you. Isn't that right, church? And some of you are just like Norm Sigrist. You're just going to be around and burn forever and ever. You're just solid. You're just stable and hard like a rock sometimes. Right, Fern? Right, Fern? You know, how many of you know it takes a fern and a norm to make a fire? Isn't that right? So you take both of these and you start your fire and you burn the hardwood and you know what you get in the end? You get ashes. This is what you get. You get wood ashes. And you know what I've noticed about these wood ashes? I can't tell where the pine is and I can't tell where the cherry is or the oak. You see, the fire reduced this to its simplest denominator, ashes. Isn't that right? One isn't better than the other here. They're both have the same thing in common. They're ashes. You know, it's just like you and I. Scripture tells us that when God sends the fire, we'll be made salty again. In other words, we'll have one thing in common. I won't look at myself and say, if you go to, I just went to Rockler the other day, $6.80 a board foot. Cherry. Cheap. Cheap. Yeah. If I'm known to be something, then I want to know to be known to be this. Costly. Priceless. I mean, you can make nice things out of this. Okay things out of this. Come to my house, I'll show you some cherry. Come to my house, I probably won't show you some pine. Somehow that's, sometimes that's how we think of ourselves. That's pride. We think of ourselves better than others. We think of the people up here on the platform. They have a high position. We look at them and say, they're better than me. That's not true at all. Not at all. And God sends a fire sometimes to remind us of that and to bring us down to the lowest common denominator so that when you look at me and I look at you, there's not a whole lot of difference. There's not one person above another person. We're just all kind of alongside of each other making this thing called salt happen. How does God do it? Everyone will be salted by fire. I've learned something. When you're in the fire, learn your lesson. Because it's not fun to go back into the fire again because you didn't learn your lesson the first time. Get it right the first time. Amen? Not fun to go through it again. So, salt represents the peace that we have with one another. Salt also represents the grace that flows from our conversations. You know, there's salt on the tip of your tongue. And your tongue is the smallest member of your body, but it's also probably one of the most powerful. In fact, James, again, in chapter 3, verse 4 to 5, says, And a small runner makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is the smallest thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Whew. <laughs> Isn't there a scripture that talks about a wise person speaks very little? Or something like that? Does anybody know that scripture? Kind of doesn't let on what they don't know? Or something like that? Probably something like that. Do you realize I stand up here and I, I speak about 10,000 to 20,000 words? Do you know how many opportunities I have to make a mistake and offend somebody? 
Never. Are you? I go home and I think, oh God, I shouldn't have said that. And then Doral says, you know, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have said that. And I say, I don't know. I shouldn't have said that. So we have to be careful what we say with our tongue. It really matters what you say about one another. It matters what you say about one another, whether you're apart or you're even together. I could say something about you. I could say something about you, and we're not even together, and it still has an impact. There's a spiritual principle there. I can murder somebody with my tongue, even though the person isn't in the room. Okay, and it'll show up somewhere along the way in our relationship together. It will happen. I'm going to have to change over here. I'm sorry. I will be in a minute. There we are. I'm salty again. It really matters what you say. In fact, there's a scripture in 1 John 4.20 says this. If someone says, I love God, but hate his fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? Colossians 4, 6 says, Let all your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you know how to give an answer to everyone. The salt covenant is simple. Old Testament times, people would come together before making a long journey, and they would take their bags of salt out of their, wherever they had them, hidden probably, because Salt was precious. You could never make the journey without salt. You couldn't preserve your food. Also, you couldn't make the trip because you needed to, every once in a while, replenish the salt into your body that was lost when you sweated and other kinds of things. So salt was precious. Salt was life to these people. And so before they would leave on a journey, they would gather, the men of the group would gather, and they'd establish a salt covenant. It still happens today in many cultures, salt covenants. It's still prevalent in some of the Middle East cultures. In fact, if you go into some homes and you're about to sit down at a meal with them, they'll take the salt off the table because they know that if they share their salt with you, then they share with you also a common bond of friendship. And so they would take the salt out of their bags and put it in to some pile or some hand or something. They would mix it all together and then separate it back out and put some back in your bag and back in my bag so that my salt that was in your bag now is in their bag and vice versa. You get the picture. That was a salt covenant. And then they would make covenant promises to one another of loyalty, unity. But above all of that, they would say, I will be your friend. That's the key word to that covenant. I've defined for you what a friend is. It's somebody who knows your hopes and your dreams, walks alongside of you to make it possible. In other words, they were saying to one another, listen, this road that we're about to journey on is difficult, and I want to be there alongside of you to make it possible. I want to help you get to your destination. That's what a friend does. That's what a salt covenant is. In fact, Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 describes what a friend is. It says, a friend loves at all times. Amen? Friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but a friend is one who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus said to his disciples, I now call you my friends. Jesus is the greatest friend you can have. Amen. 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 That's why this table is a salt table. It's filled with salt. There's salt all over it. Even in the Jewish homes today, when they break bread on the Sabbath, there's salt on the table along with the bread. The father salts the bread as if to say to the children, listen, if there's anything between us, if there's any offenses, any issues between us, you need to get that settled before we can enter into the Sabbath of the Lord, before we can enter into the peace and the rest of the Lord. That's why it's important in Scripture. It says when you go to make your offering in the church, if there's anything between you and your brother... Go and settle that offering, then come and make your offering, because if you do, you've restored salt, and then God commands a blessing on the offering. Does that make sense? He commands a blessing. Uh, I got an echo here that's wiping me out. Echo. 
Okay, I'm going to put it right here. How's that? Is that better? Thank you very much. I'm learning. I'm going through this process of learning how to use this thing. It's like a lollipop, you know? Anybody want to lick? Just kidding. <laughs> so in just a moment, we're going to have a salt covenant here at Crossroads. And here's how it's going to work. On your outside aisle over there, everybody in the outside chair, look down on the floor. If you're not on an outside chair, you're the second one in. Move to the outside. Get that bowl that's on the ground. And we're going to take those bowls and we're going to pass them across the aisles. You have a salt bag in your possession. And what you do is you open up that bag and you dump that salt in there. And then when you come up for communion, you're going to refill your bag. I'm going to mix all the salt together so your salt and your salt is all going to be combined. It's all going to be together into one big bowl up here. The ushers are going to separate it, take it over to the communion tables. You'll come up and you'll fill your bag, put a couple scoops in there, put it into the bag, and then take communion. And then you can leave the church. Hang on to these bags. Um, in my mind, they're precious. I know some people are going to be filling up three or four bags for people that aren't here because they're sick um, or for whatever reason. So uh, fill up your bag, a couple scoops, so you'll have the salt in there. And what we're saying essentially to each other is that we desire to diligently preserve the unity of the Holy Spirit here at Crossroads and in our lives. Amen? We desire to be friends. That there be in this church a sense of unity and loyalty to one another. Now, over the years, I've been doing this covenant. I've had people come up to me and say, I don't want to enter into a salt covenant because I don't particularly like this person. Or I don't know this person. Or I don't know if I can trust this person. But let me ask you a question. Now, listen to me. Which one of these people are you? Listen to me. Which one of these people are you? You're all sitting around the table of the Savior on the night he was betrayed. You're one of the disciples. Which one are you? Are you Peter? You know, the one with all the pride and the arrogance who says, I'll never deny you. Is that you? Or maybe you're um, Thomas. I know Thomas. Are you Thomas? You're the doubter? Or maybe you're one of the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus that left shaking their heads saying, and, oh, we thought he was the one, but he obviously wasn't because he's dead. Or maybe you're a Judas, and you betrayed somebody, or you're a betrayer. Maybe you're one of those. You know, most of the time, we don't even know who we're sitting next to because it just hasn't come out yet. So before you judge the person next to you, you probably ought to look at yourself and ask yourself, which one of those are you? Amen? And hope that the person next to you or around you has enough forgiveness to restore you back into good favor. Because the Lord has that. He restored Peter, he restored James, he restored John, he restored all of them except for Judas, who betrayed him. And you know what Jesus said to Judas when he came into the garden to betray him and give him a kiss? He said, friend. That's what he called him. Even at the end, he called him friend because he understood the power of friendship. The power of covenant and relationships. So before you come up, forgive anybody. Let go of all your grudges and all your... I don't know, if you've got anything against anybody in here, if I've said something to you over the years, forgive me. You know, give me grace because I'm probably going to do it again. The good news is when we get to heaven, I'm probably not going to screw up because I'm going to be fully sanctified, but so will you. But until then, we can be friends. Can't we be friends? We can get along. It'll heal. It'll bring healing in our lives. We'll be salty. It'll bring light. And maybe one day you'll bring your friend in here, and they'll taste the saltiness of the church. And then they'll see Jesus, and you'll be glad. Amen? So let's pray before you come up.
Father, I just thank you in Jesus' name that you called us to be salt. And that you've called us to be light. I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for your goodness and your mercy for each and every one of us. How often we fall short. How often we look at ourselves and we think we're not fit, we're not worthy to come to this table. But clearly you say this is a table of grace. And without grace, we're all lost. Without grace, we're all failures. But, Father, when you sent your son Jesus, you sent him full of grace and truth. You sent him into this world to die for each and every one of us, to give his life. To give his life that we may hear the words that he spoke to his disciples. You are my friend. You are my companion. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will walk alongside of you. I'll make your dreams, your hopes possible. I will take you to your destiny. Thank you for that destiny that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that you are a good God, a forgiving God. For each person that comes forward now, might they experience that grace. Might they not only taste, but might they see the goodness of God in the land of the living. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. I'm going to mix this salt right now. Father, I just thank you for all the salt here that's been gathered by your people, your children. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that you bless it as people leave here with it, that they do so in an understanding that it's a commitment to be diligent to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do in here. Unify us, make us one body, one life, one loaf, in Jesus' name. Amen. I salt this bread now in the name of Jesus. And say, Father, as people take of this bread, let them taste of the saltiness of it. In his name I pray, amen. Before you have come forward, I have very special instructions. If you have any children in the nursery, the preschool, and toddlers, did I get it right? Stand up. Go ahead, don't be ashamed of them. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. Move out into the center and you come forward first. I'm doing this. And make sure when you go back there, give the teachers a big hug. Would you do that? Yes. Hold hold up right there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Could I have the servers come, please? Jesus of the glory.